Hello, welcome back. Um, it's Keith again from the Wesley Center at Chattanooga with uh, a John Wesley Life Coach video, and I apologize because I am really far behind. Um, and I thought a week behind was bad before, or three or four days, but I'm actually a couple weeks behind. But like I said, it's that time of year in the life of campus ministry, and um, it just kind of things get busy. So anyway. Uh, I'm going to jump right in because uh, probably going to take a lot of time today because what I want to talk about is pretty in-depth, and I think it's important. I'm going to set aside Mitzi Miner's outline for the time being, um, not because it's bad or anything, just because I think um, given the times and given what everyone is going through right now and kind of how people are feeling, this is probably a good time to talk about it. And that's actually one of the reasons um, I did get distracted because I kind of hemmed and hawed over whether or not to take this tack and go off uh, along on the side with this, but um, I decided to that I'd go ahead and do it. So this is, once again, this is the pastor's Bible study that we've been using um, over the Gospel of Mark, uh, and um, this is going to be over Mark 4.35 through 5.43. So if you haven't read that, you may want to pause this and come back to it. Uh, go ahead and read that section of the text first and then come back to it. But anyway, this is week five, session four, although it's severely delayed. But uh, Mitzi's heading for this lesson was um, the impact of the kingdom of God. Once again, that covers Mark 4, 35 through 543. Um, uh, so anyway, like I said, I'm going to lay aside minors outline. Once again, there's nothing wrong with it. I just feel the need to deal with um, a specific thread that I see in the text for this week. Um, I just feel that it's an important thing to do with, deal with. And, and that thread that I see in this uh, section of text is the idea of hope, issues of hope and hopelessness and despair that we see in Mark 4, 35 through 543. And I think that's a really important thing to talk about right now. You hear a lot of hopelessness from people. You hear a lot of despair, uh, despairing comments. Um, and, you know, part of that is the political climate. Part of that's some of the economic climate that people feel. But in general, you just get a feeling that people are not happy with the way things are going and that people just think everything is uh, just going downhill in a handbasket, so to speak. So let's, let's talk about this. Uh, First of all, let me, since this is John Wesley Life Coach, and I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but I try to bring in things about John Wesley throughout the whole time we're doing this. And for those of you tuning in, I apologize if um, you're trying to make comments and you can't. Unfortunately, because of trolls in the world, I had to shut comments off. Uh, we had an issue today with another video we do for Dogs and Doctrine of some people just making really lewd comments for no other reason than to just be difficult and irritating. Um, they're just they're speaking out of anger and ignorance, and I hate that for the rest of you who would actually maybe like to post comments or ask questions. But unfortunately, that's why we can't have nice things. So, but anyway, one of the things we do with Wesley Life Coach is we try to use John Wesley's experiences. John Wesley is the founder of Methodism, uh, the Wesleyan movement um, in in the church, and uh, try to use some of his experiences and writings and teachings to. Um, uh, to, to kind of enlighten what we're talking about when we talk about the Gospels. So anyway, uh, John Wesley, I don't know if you know this or not, but he was a missionary to the United States. Well, not the United States at that time. It was the colony of Georgia specifically. And he was sent to be the chaplain under General Oglethorpe to the Savannah Colony in Georgia. Um, it didn't end well. And so he has this experience where after only little more than a year, he has to return to England um, from the Georgia colony. Uh, and on the way back, he's already, he's already having a hard time because he feels like he's a failure. And I think that's something a lot of us can, can probably ex, you know, sympathize with. We've all gone through those times, and those are kind of dangerous times. On top of that, he's confronted by a horrific storm on the journey back to England. He also went through the same thing on the way to England. But he's confronted by this horrendous storm on the way back, and he has to deal with his fear of death in the midst of this fierce storm. There's a lot of stuff that comes out of this experience that Wesley has on board ship 
returning to England. And uh, a lot of things and changes in his life that are triggered by this experience of this storm and this fear that he has for his life. Uh, let me read, the, read you some from his journal here. After the storm, after he goes through the storm and survives it, he writes these words in his journal. He says, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, what is he that will deliver me from this evil heart of mischief? I have a fair summer religion. I can talk well, nay, and believe myself while no danger is near, but let death look me in the face and my spirit is troubled. Nor can I say to die is gain. He says, I have a sin of fear that when I've spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore. That's actually a quote from a guy named John Donne, who lived uh, some time before John Wesley. And it's a uh, poem that he wrote called A Hymn to God the Father. And we'll get into that later in more depth. He goes on to say, but in a storm, I think, what if the gospel be not true? Then thou art of all men most foolish, for what hast thou given thy goods, thine ease, thy friends, thy reputation, thy country, thy life? For what art thou wandering over the face of the earth? Um, a dream? A cunningly devised fable? Wesley has fallen into the, has fallen prey rather to hopelessness. He's gotten, he's He's come through a, a failing time in his life. He's seeing himself as this kind of abject failure. Um, and then he's, because of that, when he falls into this situation of fearfulness, he loses all hope. And he begins to question everything that he thought he knew. He began to question his very faith and the person in whom he has placed his faith. So that then he questions everything he's done. He's, he's really questioning. He's like, what is it I've believed in? If, if, if I've believed in the gospel, if, am I a fool for that? I've given up everything for that. I gave up my country. I gave up my family. I went to the other side of the earth. Pretty Quite literally, for his day and age, that was the, the other side of the world. That was as far away as he could possibly get. Um, be, and because he's fallen prey to this fear and this hopelessness, one of the problems with using your iPhone for these things, you get a call and it messes up your Periscope feed. So anyway, so he's lost all hope in in all the decisions he's made and the faith that he's had. So let's talk about hope. What is hope? We talk about hope a lot. I don't know that we really mean know what we mean when we talk about it. Hope is a virtue. We talk about hope all the time, but we don't really mean anything by it. Uh, we trivialize it a lot of times. We, you know, we say that we hope for a lot of things, you know, like, um, uh, you know, gee, I hope Tennessee beats Florida this year. Um, you know, oh, uh, I hope the Cubs make it to the World Series. You know, gee, I hope somebody catches that pass. Uh, we hope for a lot of things, but um, it's just kind of a trivial thing. We don't necessarily know what we mean when we say we hope for those things. So let's quote Piper, or Peeper rather. You've heard me quote him before. Um, this is the book I'm talking about. Joseph Peeper, Faith, Hope, and Love. It's good stuff. Um, he talks about, he tells us that hope is a theological virtue, right? Uh, for, as far as Christians are concerned, we see hope as a theological virtue. That's, there's a lot more to that, and that's best left for another time. But, um, you know, that's what we talk about. When, when we talk about faith, hope, and love in a Christian context, we're talking about theological virtues. Um, as Pieper defines it, he says, Hope says it will turn out well, or more accurately and characteristically, it will turn out well for mankind. Or even more characteristically, it will turn out well for us, for me, myself. That's what hope does. That's what hope believes. It believes in a good final outcome. Um, and that's, once again, from that book, Faith, Hope, and Love. Uh, hopelessness is a vice. Uh, so a vice is the opposite of a virtue. And I'm glad I could clear that up for you. I'm pretty sure you were up to date on that. Um, we have virtues and we have vices. Uh, there are two kinds of hopelessness. When we talk about talk about hopelessness as a vice, right? And, and I, I apologize up front because I am giving this a very cursory glance in this. Um, this could be a whole series of things, to, of videos to talk about this. But anyway, 
When we talk about hopelessness, there are two kinds of hopelessness that somebody like Joseph Pieper wants us to remember. The first one is presumption, uh, presumptuousness. Uh, and that's, an, once again, another conversation for another time. It's a specific kind of hopelessness um, where uh, you've ever had somebody tell you that you, they think you presume too much. Um, that's, that's a whole other uh, whole nother issue that we'll probably just have to leave for another time. Uh, the other kind of hopelessness that Pieper tells us about is despair, and that's really important. And that's what's really going on in the life of Wesley at this time, and he's crossing the Atlantic, and it's what we see a lot in these texts. Um, Pieper, following up on his dis definition of hope, says that the most characteristic form of despair says it will turn out badly for us and me myself. So hopefulness Having hope says, I believe things will turn out well. I will believe things will turn out well for me and for everyone else involved. Um, despair says, I believe everything will turn out badly for me and for everyone. And that's, I think, what we hear the most of uh, right now in our culture, this this kind of despair. So knowing this, having gotten all that that kind of groundwork done, let's take a look at the texts for today, Mark 4.35 through 5.43. Um, and let's think about them as a battle with fear and with despair and with hopelessness, okay? So we've got this fearful question that's posed to us in 435 through 41. And it's really, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's the fear of an indifferent God. That's really what's going on in this little scene when the disciples are in the boat that's tossed by the storm out on the Sea of Galilee. They're, they have this fear that God is, that Jesus is completely indifferent to their situation. They say, teacher, don't you care that we are drowning? Um, the, the Greek there is umele, uh, which means, does it not matter? In other words, does it not matter to you what happens to us? This goes back to Pieper's definition of, fear, of despair. It's this fear that things will not work out. Uh, despair in the face of hardship and turmoil that God may be totally indifferent to our suffering. That's that's what's going on here, and that's, I believe, a quote from Pieper. I forgot to note that, but I'm pretty sure that's a quote from Pieper once again. It's it's despair in the face of hardships. And remember that, that word hardships again. Um, you know, we face hardships all the time. We have to face up to hardships. You know, life can be pretty arduous. That's an important word. Remember that for later. Arduous. Um, and when we despair in the face of all these hardships uh, and turmoil that we that's just part of daily life, we have this fear that God may be just may not care. You know, as the disciples say in the boat, does it not matter to you? And we find ourselves saying that. And unfortunately, I think sometimes we already make the decision that no, he doesn't and no one else does either. So Jesus responds to this fear. How does he respond to this fear that he gets from the disciples? Well, he responds by becoming actively engaged in the situation. He stands up and he says to the wind and the seas, peace be still. Now, I'm personally not even sure that he's not also addressing the disciples at this moment because they're pretty caught up in this. But he says, peace be still. He becomes actively engaged. You know, and by the way, Jesus was in the boat too. He was a part of this. There's something going on here where they they forget that. They forget that Christ, Jesus travels with them. But they're just totally caught up in this fear that they may all die, that they all may all they may drown, and that he does not care. Well, if he's in the same boat with you, he's probably intimately involved with this. He's probably invested in it. So he was right alongside them in the midst of the turmoil. Like I said, we often forget that God is with us when we are caught up in despair. That's one of the worst things about it. We forget that we are not alone. We, we tell ourselves we're alone. We convince ourselves that we're totally alone, that nobody else cares. Um, but that's not the case, at least not what we as Christians believe. So the next text we have is Mark 5, 1 through 20. And this is after they've come across the sea and they get to the to the to meet this demoniac, right? Um, and here we see the despair of a hateful God, right? They come across this man who's completely possessed, and the, there's this conversation that takes place between the demon-possessed 
man and Jesus. He asks questions like, what have you to do with me? He says, will you torture me? And this isn't just the fear that God uh, that, that God's indifferent to someone's existence or to his existence, but it's a fear that he actually hates us and is seeking our destruction. That's the fear that's coming across in this question. You know, are you here to destroy me? Do you, do you hate me that much? Or are you going to just torture me? Are you going to, to make yourself happy by seeing me miserable? And, um, yeah, that's a demon-possessed man. This is the, the demons speaking to Jesus. But we hear that a lot from people. We hear people that are convinced that God just has it out for them. Um, and we still hear that today. So what is Jesus' response to the fear that's being shown by this demon-possessed man? Well, Jesus' response to the demon-possessed man is to show mercy, oddly enough. Um, amazingly, um, he even shows mercy to something so foul and so unclean as the demons which possess this man. So, what does that mean for us? Well, um... That's, that's pretty important, because you probably need to remind yourself that, you know, if, if there are these times where you think you're so much at the bottom of the barrel, and that you're just, you know, you're just the, the last thing anybody wants to spend any time with, well, um, if Jesus was willing to show mercy to something so foul as this legion of demons, and, you know, not just outright destroy them, of course, they were apparently pretty capable of destroying themselves because they all ran into the pigs and immediately drowned the pigs. Um, is he not going to give you mercy? I think that's that's the thing we forget. And once again, that's the, the horrific nature of despair and fear that we completely lose sight of who God is. So now we come to Mark 5, 21 through 43, and it's this this kind of story that hinges upon uh, the healing of a woman, uh, and it's this battle with fear and with hopelessness, with fear and despair. So we have a father coming to Jesus to plead for his daughter's help. This is 521 through 24. It just kind of starts the ball rolling. So you have this leader of the synagogue, Jairus, um, however you say that, really bad with biblical names, sometimes worse than others. But anyway, he uses, interestingly enough, the same language that the demoniac uses in 5, 7 through 10. Uh, the demoniac says, um, first he says, parakale, parakale, which is I implore, um, which parakale, and then he says, parakaleson, which is they implored, that's the plural. And when the, this father shows up to Jesus to ask him to come and, and heal his daughter, who's very sick and on death's door, he says parakale, which is he begs. So it's the same, um, the same language going on. And it kind of, you know, it's, it's similar to even the, the language that the disciples use. Um, but they're using a different word. As, you know, they, they plead with Jesus in the boat. And that kind of leads me to some questions. You know, does, Je does Jairus feel, or fear rather, that Jesus won't come to his aid? Uh, does he fear that Jesus won't arrive soon enough? Does he fear that Jesus won't be enough? And if so, what happens next in the story just must be excruciating, pa excruciatingly painful for this father to watch. So, you know, you, when you implore someone, when you beg someone, it's kind of because you have this expectation that they don't really want to do this. You know, they don't really want to, they don't have your best, in, your, your best outcomes in mind. So, here you have this father coming before Jesus, pleading with him to come as, as quickly as he can, because his daughter's on death's door, uh, to come and heal her. And then what happens next delays the whole thing. Um, this is 524 through 34. It says that a woman with an issue suffering from an illness uh, for 12 years, it says. And this illness is specifically that she was, has, as the scripture often says, is a dish, an issue of blood. In other words, she has a, a bloody discharge. It's a gynecological issue, and she has been constantly hemorrhaging and bleeding uh, for 12 years. Um, and there's a lot that we could get into with that issue. You know, anytime you see just a note and a tip, anytime you see a specific number in the Bible, 
um, in a, especially in a narrative like the Gospels, um, pay attention to that. You know, the number 12 is not an accident, but that's not what I'm focusing on today. So I'll let you look that up on your own. So, so she's been suffering for 12 years, 12 years with this bloody discharge, 12 years of isolation from in her uncleanness. And I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about honor and shame and the idea, the issues of purity. Well, anything like this that makes you ritually impure, it cuts you off from everybody else because they don't want to be around you either. They don't want to get that funk on them. Um, they don't want to become ritually impure because it cuts them off. And, and especially when you have you know, people like Mark's talking about, like the Pharisees who are really concerned about this, it's, a, it's an issue. So she's had 12 years of this discharge, 12 years of isolation, and 12 years, we're told, of just failed cures. You know, um, If anybody is in a position where they should just abandon all hope, um, this this woman is there, but we're told that she reaches out in faith and hope, uh, even though she has every reason to despair. She reaches out for just to try to touch Jesus. Um, it's almost like she's saying, you know, I don't mean to be a bother. Uh, I just just a touch. Just let me brush up against your your robe, and and I'll be good. I'll go on my way, and I'll be fine after that. Well. We're told that Jesus responds to her, and you know, you have in the text where he you know, says he feels power go out from him. He says, "Who touched me?" But then she comes and she has to tell the story to him, and his response to her, her hopefulness and her faith is to say, "Your faith has made you well. You know, go. Um, your faith, daughter." has made you well. And that's important too, that he addresses her as daughter. It means that she's part of the family again, that she's, you know, she's a part of the household of faith, so to speak. Well, finally, now this father um, gets Jesus's attention, um, but it's it's not in a good way. We get now to Mark 5, 35 through 43, and we're told that the people come from his house and they say, don't bother. Just, just don't even bother. It's not even worth it anymore. Why bother the master? Why bother the teacher is the language. Um, so presumably Jairus has witnessed all of this. He's, he's come to Jesus. He's asked Jesus to come with him. Jesus is on his way. He's got some hope that, oh, well, maybe we'll make it in time. And the woman pops up and she gets this healing. And maybe, I don't know, maybe at this point he's thinking that she got the healing that was meant for my daughter. You know, the you know, the, the, the language in Mark says, and he felt the power go out of him. If you're in a culture, once again, that sees that there's limits to things and puts limits on God's ability, then he might be thinking, you know, oh, well, maybe there's only so much power, then Jesus has used it up for today, and there won't be any left for my daughter. Um, so he's been waiting through all this. He's been painfully waiting through this delay, and now he's confronted with this news of his daughter's death. Um, he's confronted with all the questions that come up in our lives when we ha go through despair. We, the questions that come up are, why bother? You know, uh, why bother the teacher is what the people are saying to him. Why bother trying? Why bother caring? The, these are the questions that despair leads us into. Um, once again, going back to Joseph Pieper, talking about despair, he says the most characteristic form of despair says it will turn out badly for us and for me myself. Um, it is the fear that all is for naught. It's, it's this idea that everything I've worked for, everything I've tried for, is just has just gone by the wayside. It was meaningless. It's the same thing that uh, Wesley is talking about on the ship. He was like, what did I invest all my time in? Like, if, if I'm just going to die, if I've, I've been this failure and I've, this huge failure and I've, I've messed things up and now I'm, you know, like I'm I'm going to die at sea. What did I waste my time for? It was just all for nothing. Why should I bother trying? Why should I bother caring? And that's where the real danger lies. And Jesus knows this. And Jesus responds to, I think he responds to the question of the people, this issue of why bother. And he responds to the fear that he sees in this father's heart um, and confronts it directly. He says to him, he says to him, don't be afraid, just keep trusting. And that's how the CEB translates it. The Greek is me uh, phobu monon pistue, which is literally uh, 
don't fear, only believe. It's really simple. It's just it's a blunt statement. Um, there's, you know, it's not fancy language. He just looks at the guy, looks the guy in the eyes, and says, "Don't fear, just believe," because that's the seed of of despair right there. Is if you if you can't get past that fear, if you can't get past that despair, the hope, you know, there's no hopeful hopefulness for you. There's no hope. Um, so anyway, hopelessness despair and the life of the Christian. What does this all mean? That, that's great that we talked about this. Why is this important? Um, now I'm going to talk a lot about a guy named Aquinas, and um, I know that's probably not usual for Methodists to talk about a, a Catholic theologian, but he's pretty important. Um, so let's talk, let's talk about hopelessness and despair and the life of the, of the Christian. Uh, Aquinas says this, and you're going to have to pay attention here because it's kind of old language. He says, despair and unbelief consist principally in aversion from the immutable good, but consequently they imply conversion to a mutable good insofar as the soul that is a, that is a deserter from God must necessarily turn to other things. Immutable good, mutable good. Okay, in other words, despair leads us to take our hope from God, that is the immutable good, think unchangeable, right? So despair causes us to take our hope away from God and place it in other things, mutable goods, temporary things, right? You know, you're, I see a lot of people that are apparently devastated because college football doesn't work out for them. If you're that devastated, you may want to rethink what you're putting your hope in, right? So that would be a mutable good, right? But other things too, you know, wealth, um, uh, van our vanity, things like that. So, in other, other words, uh, despair and hopelessness leads the Christian into sin, to, to put it pretty s simply. Um, when anything that takes our, our focus and takes our hope away from God and puts it in other things which are just transient, you know, just here today and gone tomorrow. In other words, don't store up your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Have you heard that before? So, when we when despair and hopelessness get a hold of us and they take our faith away from God, that leads us into sin because it's putting our, we begin to put our faith in other things, primarily ourselves. Uh, Aquinas goes on to say, when hope is given up, men rush headlong into sin. That's the way he puts it. They rush headlong into sin and we are drawn away from good works. In other words, we are drawn away from the things that God has called us to do and called us to be. Um, so remember we talked about John Donne earlier, this guy that John Wesley quotes. Um, some interesting things that, that happen after Wesley's voyage uh, and his experience on his voyage. Um, so, you know, it, it, it illustrated once again this slippery slope that that hopelessness and despair lead us into. Um, and it's in these moments that we come to doubt God's grace and mercy, uh, not necessarily as it applies to the world, but as it applies to us as individuals. Once again, Aquinas says, he who despairs judges that for him and that state on account of some particular dispositive, in other words, something that they've done or something negative about them, there is no hope in the divine mercy. And that's, that's where this begins to get really scary because you start to say things about God that you don't want to say. You're, you're saying that God is not merciful. Remember, it's, it's, the fear of, um, it's the fear of a God who doesn't care like the disciples had in the boat. It's the fear of a God who is not just doesn't care but is out for no good for you uh, simply because it's you. Um, this is the fear that both Aquinas and Wesley see as a dangerous sin. Um, so, remember, John Wesley's quoting John Donne. Uh, and if, if you've never read John Donne, if you are somebody who likes poetry, you might want to get a hold of his book, um, or it's officially the Complete English Poems. Um, another, actually, you've probably heard John Donne and you didn't know it. I don't know if you've ever heard uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, right? That, that great line, it's not just... Um, it's not just the title of a novel. It actually comes from this book, uh, John Donne's Devotions. 
uh, upon emergent occasions. And what it is, these are devotions, these are reflections that he wrote while he was recovering from an illness. Uh, so I just recommend John Donne anyway. It's a good read if you want some really good devotional read. But John Donne has these religious poems, these, um, and, and they call them divine poems. And I'm just going to read to you a hymn to God the Father. Um, a hymn to God the Father. Wilt thou forgive that sin where I begun, which was my sin though it were done before? Will thou forgive that sin through which I run, and do run still, though still I do deplore? When thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. Wilt thou forgive that sin which I have won others to sin, and made my sin their door? Wilt thou forgive that sin which I did shun, a year or two, but wallowed in a score? When thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. I have a sin of fear, that when I have spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore. But swear by thyself, that at my death thy sun shall shine as he shines now, and heretofore. And having done that, thou hast done, I fear no more. We don't, uh, we don't often look at fear as, a, as an occasion to sin. Um, but I think Dunn is right there, that, um, that our fear and our hopelessness, our despair, and as, as he says, um, can even lead others into sin. Um, especially, you know, for those of, those of us who are, are kind of expected uh, to, to have great hope, um, when we start to see no hope, um, the people who are looking to us for leadership, it's really hard for them. Uh, you know, and this is this is something we see not just in the political arena, you know, as far as U.S. politics, you know, the the way the nations run, but even with within uh, church leadership, uh, you know, you have church leaders that are kind of I don't know if you know that great scene from Lord of the Rings, um, uh, what is it the 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 Return of the King, I think, is that one. And you have the steward of Gondor, and he sees the attacking armies, and he just gives up all hope, and he stands at the top of the ramparts and just tells the, everyone to flee the city. And people who were fighting the battle, right, against the incoming forces of evil begin see him freaking out, and they begin to second-guess themselves. Um, that's when Gandalf runs up and cracks him on the head and um, shuts him up. But, uh, you know... Even our fear and our despair can lead others into uh, their own fear and despair, and then it's that's just not a good thing. So, uh, you know, it's it's what Dunn is doing here. It's a painfully honest confession of the, his great fear of abandonment. That's Wesley picks up on this and and uses it in his own journal. Says, you know, I have a fear that when it's all said and done, that I'm just going to perish on the shore and nobody cares, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a dangerous thing. Um, despair, uh, leads to acedia, right? And, and I'm sure you know what that is, right? Um, it's okay if you don't. Uh, acedia, uh, just means that we give up. Um, it's, it goes back to the, the, the question that the, the people ask the ask the father, right? They ask Jairus uh, as they come to tell him his daughter's dead. And they're like, "Why bother?" That's that's the question of Asidia. Uh Despair is especially dangerous because it uh, and it, it feeds on our sorrow. Uh, Aquinas uh, comments on Second Corinthians two seven. He says, "Those who are sorrowful fall the more easily into despair. Hope gives birth to joy, while on the contrary, despair is born of sorrow." Um, Wesley gives the testimony of a guy named Christian David. He was a Moravian minister um, living at the time of Wesley. And um, you should read the history of the Moravians. It's pretty interesting uh, if you get a chance sometime. But he talks to this guy who was a preacher among the Moravians. They were kind of a, like the persecuted among the persecuted Christians in Europe. Um, and he talks about what happens to his congregation after he had spent some time uh, with a Calvinist minister and uh, kind of bought into some of the things that, that, that they had taught him. Um, so he says, I contracted an intimate acquaintance with a Calvinist 
who after some time brought me over to his opinion touching election and reprobation, and by me were many of our brethren likewise brought over to the same opinions. And what he means there is this understanding that uh, when, you, when you boil it down, this un, uh, kind of Calvinism he's talking about is this idea that God has created two groups of people. One group he, he created to be saved so that he could be glorified, and another group that he created uh, to be damned so that he could be glorified. And uh, so you're either in one of, the, one of those groups, and there's no going back and forth. You're in one or, or you're in the other. Um, and so he believed, he bought into that, and then he began went home and started preaching it to his people, and they bought into it. And he says, about this time, we were in great straits, wherewith many were dejected. I endeavored to comfort them with the sense of God's love towards them. In other words, he was reminding them that God cared for them, God saved, you know, given up his son's life to save them. All these things that are really important to remember when you're in hard times and you're wondering whether it's worthwhile to go on. Um, he says, but they answered, nay, it may be he hath no love towards us. It may be that we are not of the election, but God hated us from eternity, and therefore he has suffered all these things to come upon us. So here we've got John Donne and John Wesley talking about this fear that God just is indifferent to what happens to us. And now we've got the people that Christian David is preaching to who are afraid that God may actually have bare ill will for them and and really be after them. So these are dangerous things. You know, hopeless despair causes us to question the goodness of God. It's um and and one way of looking at this is that, that is a, as a sin against the Holy Spirit, because you're saying something about God that um, that is is not true. Uh, you remember we talked about the people that were standing outside the house when Jesus was casting out demons uh, earlier in this study, and they said said he casts out demons by the power of Satan. Um, and he, you know Jesus says that's. Be careful, because you're saying something about God that you probably don't want to say. Um, Joseph Pieper, again, he says, he brings this up when he talks about despair, this uh, being a sin against the Holy Spirit. He says, I say deliberately no more than that despair moves us into the vicinity of this mystery, this mystery of what does it mean to commit a sin against the Holy Spirit. He says it's difficult for us to find forgiveness. In this, in in that situation, think about it this way: If you can't even trust in God's goodness, how can you trust enough to even seek reconciliation with God? So, if you don't, if you already don't trust that He wants reconciliation, how can you even go further? How can you ask for that reconciliation? How can you seek out that redemption and that forgiveness? And that brings us to this word acedia that I mentioned earlier: this issue of why bother. Um, Aquinas once again talks about it. He says, when hope is given up. People, my language, not his. I'm trying to make it a little bit more inclusive. It says, people rush headlong into sin and are drawn away from good works. People who suffer in sorrow and despair live in a world of, they live in a world of this, why bother? They suffer from acedia. They just give up. Think about this as somebody who's just so worn out and so, has just given up on everything that they just don't do anything. It's, it's, it's almost like it's too painful to move. There's, they can't see any point in moving. Um, they give up. They stop trying. You know, it's the question, once again, why bother the master? Like, she's dead. Why, why bother him anymore? There's no point trying. So, Christianity, right? How's this, how's this impact us? Christianity is, and what, what Aquinas calls the arduous good, right? Um, or at least maybe that's me paraphrasing him. Um, the arduous good. What does that mean? Well, the Christian life is what was what Aquinas, like I said, calls an arduous good. That means it's contrary to what many of our prosperity gospel theologians uh, would have us believe. Christianity as a life spent following Christ is not full of grins and giggles. It's not full of private jets and expansive mansions that we can name and claim on our taxes, right? Um, 
the Christian life as Wesley and Aquinas well understood, as John Donne understood and worked with, is arduous. Um, it, it's hard. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes focus. Um, that means it takes effort and faith in the face of all sorts of trials and sorrows. It takes effort to see where God is going. It takes effort to see where God is leading us. It takes faith to remember that Christ is urging us on and saying, don't fear, only believe, right? Um, you know, and our times and marks are not that different. Um, as a community, we find ourselves in the same boat as the disciples, and we're, t we're just tossed on this chaotic sea. Every day there's more bad news that comes out, and we don't know which way to look. And we are probably looking to the heaven saying, does it not matter to you? Are you completely indifferent to our plight? Um, but Christ is with us. He's in the same boat as us. Um, as individuals, you know, we find ourselves at the mercy of a legion of problems um, that separate us from, from our family and our friends. But Christ is with us. Christ is there in mercy. And as individuals... You know, we face the fear of death, um, and often the most painful kind, of the, which is the death of a loved one. But Christ is with us. Um, we face this arduous journey to health and wholeness after so many failures and so much bad news, but Christ is with us. So the question, you know, the question remains then, I think, when we deal with this issue of faith and hope and this issue of despair and hopelessness, sometimes the question doesn't really need need to be, is Christ with us? The question that we should probably ask ourselves is, are we with Christ? Because, you know, I think it's like the disciples. They Things can be so bad, and, and things can be so rough, um, and the, the, the struggle can see, seem so harsh and arduous that we... Um, we forget that Christ is, that Jesus is in the same boat with us, that he's, he's right there alongside us. Uh, and sometimes things can seem so horrific that we, we just assume that it's not a fear of an indifferent God, but it's a fear of, of a malevolent God. And we've, we forget that Christ is standing there right before us. And, and sometimes I think we can get so caught up in, as John Donne says, wallowing in this, this sin of fear and despair that we don't even realize, you know, that Christ is with us. And it's not so much that he's not with us, it's just we're not with him anymore. We've, won we've walked off. And, you know, we can get ourselves into a situation where we no longer look to him and no longer trust that he is there for us. So, uh, that was probably long and um, probably a little bit uh, smoky, but uh, it was something I kind of felt like I needed to deal with, especially in just the way things are going. So, um, we'll be back with more. I'm probably going to try to post to double up this week um, so that I can get caught up. But anyway... Thank you. Just go ahead and read through Mark, and uh, we'll catch up to you again later.